Dr. Min Deng, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Dermatology and director of the Mohs Micrographic Surgery Service. She received her medical degree from Case Western University School of Medicine and Dermatology Residency at the University of Chicago. She subsequently can be completed her Mohs Micrographic Surgery Fellowship at Cooper University Hospital. She is a fellow of the American College of Mohs Surgery. In addition to performing Mohs, she also sees patients in her high-risk skin cancer clinic. So welcome, Dr. Deng. Thank you. Um, so this is definitely still something I'm getting used to, the, the virtual um, realm. So please let me know if um, at any point um, you can't see my screen because I've apparently done that once or twice before. Um, so, you know, um, day in and day out, this is kind of uh, something that's uh, very common in my clinic. I see a lot of basal cells, a lot of squamous cells, um, and I'm sure you all do as well. Um, but hopefully over the next hour, I'll be able to share some of the new literature that's come out in the past several years, um, show you that the field is really still evolving, um, and hopefully teach you um, some things that maybe you're still not, uh, may not know. Um, all right, so I have no financial relationships to disclose. Uh, these are my objectives to um, discuss, um, you know, uh, basal cell carcinomas, uh, squamous cell carcinomas, um, especially the latest guidelines um, uh, for uh, staging uh, for squamous cell carcinomas. And then also, um, I wanted to end the talk with, you know, it's great to talk about basal cells and squamous cells, but um, what do we know about um, uh, prevention? Okay. So basal cell carcinomas. Um, so as you all probably know, and I think you can see my um, uh, pointer here. Uh, this is just a cartoon diagram of your um, skin, um, and the first top layer is your epidermis. And you have basal cells along the basal layer of the um, of the uh, epidermis, and that's why they're called basal cell carcinomas. Um, I explain this to patients because it really impacts how they present and also impacts um, how they grow. So the first thing that a lot of patients come in um, and they can be surprised about is that the basal cell carcinoma, even though it looks teeny tiny on the surface of the skin, can actually have really extensive disease underneath the surface of the skin. And the rationale for that is because these basal cells really grow under the surface of the skin. So by the time they kind of show up to the surface, oftentimes they've already had a, um, some time to grow laterally or invade before it ever shows up on the surface of the skin. And I also, um, uh, want to point this out because basal cells are usually held together by, um, you know, adhesion molecules. And so usually if you, you know, rub your skin or you traumatize your skin, it doesn't really bleed. One of the hallmarks of basal cell carcinomas, of course, are the fact that they bleed. And that's because this, it's the disorganized growth of the basal cells. So I just like to show this diagram to start off uh, talking about uh, basal cells. So you probably all know basal cell is the most common skin cancer in the world, uh, more, more common than um, you know, your breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer combined. Um, it's very difficult to know exactly how many because basal cells and squamous cells are not part of any national registry. Um, but it is something that um, we, we think estimates uh, have been as high as um, 4 million a year um, in the US. And the incidence is increasing around the world and Asian countries, Latin American countries, um, as well as um, countries where um, patients have paler skin. Um, the only um, country that has not uh, continued to see an increase is in Australia. Common risk factors, as you all know, phenotype, you know, so pale skin, blue eyes, um, history of sun exposure. Um, and it's really childhood exposure and intermittent intense exposure. So when we've surveyed patients and asked them about their history of sun exposure, um, it's really the people who said, you know, they live in cold climates and they go to the beach every summer. Those are the patients at higher, highest risk of developing basal cells. It's not the farmers who are out you know, all year round with lots of cumulative um, sun exposure. And then it's really the exposure that you got as a childhood. So the more sunburn someone had as a child, um, the higher their risk of developing basal cells in the future. Um, I don't know if many of you know, but back in about the 60s or so, we used to treat um, tinea capitis and facial acne with radiation um, in kids. So those kids um, are now adults and um, we, we do see a lot of um, skin cancer in those patients, unfortunately. And again, ionizing radiation and immunosuppression um, are all risk factors. So clinical behavior, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, basal cell, it's not really that dangerous. And that's true. Um, it's got an overall very low metastatic rate. It's about 0.003%. Um, 
However, metastasis does occur. And when it does occur, um, now this is based off of old data, and uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the newer medications, targeted therapies later. Uh, so this may change in the future, but this is based on historical data prior to targeted therapies. Um, in the historical literature, regional metastasis, um, you had a median 87 month survival and then distant metastasis um, to lungs, to bones, um, it's about 24 month survival. And uh, um, that's a very poor prognosis if it's in the uh, bones. Uh, even if it doesn't metastasize, however, it does have very high morbidity because it basically infiltrates anything in its path, um, whether it's muscle, cartilage, or bone. Um, this is an example. Um, so here is an example of um, intravascular um, basal cell, um, and then obviously a very large aggressive basal cell. Um, these are the more typical basal cells that you'll see. So we describe them as pearly papules. A lot of times they'll be flesh colored or again, kind of shiny if you can kind of see. Um, they may be umbilicated. So again, a lot of times when patients come in, the first thing they'll say is, you know, it's a bleeding, it's a bleeding pimple. Or a lot of men will say, um, you know, I cut myself shaving, but it's the same spot that they keep on cutting themselves at. Um, and so whenever I hear that um, history, the first thing I think about the cell and I think I need to biopsy it. Um, so often pearly uh, papule um, with uh, overlying telangiectasias and they can be um, umbilicated in the center. So the most important thing for you to know though is you know, how do we distinguish, um, um, when I talk about basal cells and squamous cells, how do we distinguish the ones that are kind of low risk from the ones that are high risk, the ones that can really infiltrate deeply, the ones that really, we really need to, you know, um, they should all really be treated, but the ones that really need um, something more precise like most surgery or, or more targeted therapies. So these are uh, clinical features associated with aggressive behavior. So large tumors, tumor size greater than two centimeter, um, uh, over 50% of metastatic basal cells originate from what we call giant tumors. And those are tumors greater than five centimeters in diameter. So diameter is a great um, thing to look for. Location on the head and neck, especially the ears, the nose and the eyes, they co correlate with greater subclinical spread. Um, they're very sensitive cosmetic areas, but they're very sensitive functional areas. And if you especially think about the ears, there's really not a whole lot of tissue there before you're on cartilage um, or on the nose, same thing. You're not, there's not a lot of tissue there. It's not like your back um, where you, know, you can grow for a while before it infiltrates anything more substantial. Any history of radiation exposure? Um, greater than 50% of patients with metastatic basal cells have had a history of radiation therapy. Um, and we know that radiogenic or radio recurrent basal cells um, have higher recurrence rates. So those are gonna be your more aggressive basal cells. Any history of prior treatment um, are gonna be correlated with greater subclinical spread and higher chance of recurrence. Um, think about it this way. Number one, um, you know, usually we have standard treatments and if we treated it standardly and in a standard fashion and it still came back, then that means that in the interim from the time it was treated to the time it's recurred, it's really had a chance to grow. So oftentimes those will no longer um, respond very well to your standard um, traditional excisional surgeries. Um, there are also histologic features associated with aggressive behavior. So when you get a report on a biopsy um, and a patient you know, it just says basal cell cancers, these are some of the things I want you to pay attention to. Um, perineural invasion, just like with any tumor, is a bad prognosis, um, correlated with uh, poor prognosis. Um, but there's also aggressive histologic subtypes. So the most common basal cells are your superficial basal cells and your nodular basal cells. So those probably account for the majority of basal cells. However, there are other subtypes of basal cells. There are infiltrative basal cells, morpheiform, sometimes called sclerosing uh, basal cells, micronodular basal cells, and then basal squamous or sometimes called, uh, some uh, pathologists call them metatypical basal cells. And those are aggressive. Uh, they're correlated with greater subclinical spread. They're more likely to invade deeply um, and, uh, and they're uh, disproportionately represented in uh, giant basal cells and metastatic basal cells. So this is an interesting question. Um, are histologic subtypes stable during disease progression? So this question comes up because if we're talking about these aggressive histologic subtypes, the question is, you know, are they, were they aggressive to begin with, um, you know, when they first presented primarily, or did they turn into those aggressive histologic subtypes on recurrence or upon metastasis? Um, and so there is actually literature um, looking at this um, question. So um, 
these authors looked at 21 recurrent basal cells versus their primary lesions, and they noted that they had the exact same histologic pattern. So it does appear to be stable from primary to recurrence. And then um, when authors have also looked at metastatic basal cells and compared them to prior recurrences and also the primary lesions, again, um, they seem to show the same histologic pattern. So it seems like these are stable um, from the get-go. So when we talk about nodular and superficial, I want you to kind of have a picture of what these look like. So this is your very prototypical basal cell, pearly um, papule with telangiectasias. And under the microscope, you see these big balls of bas basaloid cells. Um, this is your nodular basal cell subtype, okay? The superficial basal cell subtype um, is actually very deceptive. Um, these are not aggressive, they're not invasive, they're not very heavily invasive. However, um, they tend to really extend quite wide, often um, far wider than you can see clinically. Um, and this is what it correlates to. So you just see these really kind of little basaloid um, tips along the, um, along the base of the uh, epidermis. There can be a pigmented basal cell subtype. These are often mistaken for melanomas and uh, patients with more pigment in their skin. And then these are the more aggressive subtypes that I mentioned. So these are infiltrative basal cell cancers on the right, and then these are micronodular basal cells um, on the left. The micronodular are much smaller tumors, um, uh, and uh, they're very easily missed, and they tend to be more uh, associated with more um, locally aggressive disease, as well as the infiltrative type. The morpheiform is um, more of a scar-like um, uh, basal cell. So a lot of times these can be mistaken for scars, actually. Um, one tip that I have for you is sometimes I'll rub the scars or or what, what uh, these lesions, and if they turn a little bit more red or a little bit more pink, um, sometimes that's my clue. And also if they've been there for a little while, there's no history of trauma, um, that's my clue that that could be a basal cell. Um, uh, those are also um, more clinically challenging to diagnose um, and histologically uh, challenging because um, of that scar tissue can really hide um, cells within them. And on the left are the basal squamous carcinoma. So these are basal cells with squamous cell features. Um, and there is suggestion that these are actually more aggressive than both basal cells and squamous cells by themselves. So this is an example of a morpheiform basal cell. This is a scar-like basal cell. So you can note how it's kind of pink. And of course, you can ask if there's a history of trauma. And oftentimes, there is not. So the basal cell uh, squamous carcinoma, as I mentioned, has um, the literature suggests that this is actually more aggressive. Um, it has histologic features of basal cells and squamous cells. Um, the metastatic rate um, has been reported as high as um, up to 9.6% in the literature. And so in comparison for squames, we usually talk about 5%. Um, they have about a 45% recurrence rate after excision, and even after most surgery, they have about a 4 to 9% recurrence rate. So these do tend to be a little bit more aggressive if you see this on your pathology report. Um, please note it. So what are the treatment options? I'm sure you're all very familiar with many of these. Um, so the vast majority of basal cells are probably treated with just traditional excisional surgery. Um, most micrographic surgery um, is great for high-risk cancers, um, for functionally, cosmetically sensitive cancers. Um, there's radiation therapy, which we'll talk about, and then vismodigib, which is our targeted uh, therapy. So conventional excisional surgery. So this is sort of our one size fits all approach. Uh, we use standard margins of four millimeter margins uh, peripherally around the tumor. Um, and the one thing that this, um, one of the downsides of doing this kind of conventional surgery is there's actually no guidelines for how deep to take these tumors. We only have peripheral margin guidelines. So four millimeter margins around the edge, but do you go into the fat? If you're on the nose, you know, do you go down to cartilage? Um, so you do have to take into account that, you know, the, the layers of the skin are not all the same when it's on the face versus on the back versus on the hand. Um, so there's, there's no real guidance for how deep to take these with conventional surgery. However, this is good for um, the majority of our basal cells, especially those on uh, low risk um, body sites and uh, without features of aggressive behavior. Um, so this is just showing how traditional surgery is processed, um, and so you do have to understand this to understand Mohs. So with traditional surgery, um, it's sent off to our pathology labs, and in the uh, labs, uh, they process them by vertically bread loafing them. So on the right-hand side, what you can see is the tumor. You've taken kind of your blind margins or your four millimeter standard margins, and then they take, um, you know, four micron sections, and, um, you know, they will take, depending on the lab, they can take, you know, you know, three sections, they can take 20 sections, but they're gonna take representative pieces and only look at those representative pieces. 
So there is a possibility that you could miss tumor, which is why we do always take wider margins than what we can see clinically uh, with our naked eye. Um, one of the pitfalls with this procedure um, with traditional processing is that you're only evaluating less than 1% of the uh, true surgical margin. Um, so you could have a false negative margin, right? So your pathologist says it's negative and they're, they're correct. Um, and all the slides that they looked at, it was all negative, but there is a chance that you could have a false negative because you just didn't section in the areas where the tumor extended. So most surgery, um, as many of you probably are already familiar with, um, is a different way of processing. So instead of processing vertically, um, the way I explain it to my patients is, um, you know, we take that bread loaf and instead of taking the loaves out, we're now taking the crust off. So we're taking the outside layer out. We're looking all the way around, all the way underneath. Um, so we get 360 degree margin evaluation. Um, the difference between Mohs um, and traditional surgery is that, you know, I'm not as concerned about what is in the middle of the lesion because that's out. What I really care about is margin control. And this is um, what gives us um, the best margin control. So what we do is we, you know, mark around the lesion. I still, we still take a um, margin, maybe one or two millimeters. Um, and then um, we orient it and we process it via frozen section. So it's all done in the lab um, on the same day as the surgery. And then if there is any cancer, um, we can map it. We can say, you know, is it 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock? You know, do I need to go wider or is it deeper? Do we need to go deeper? And then you just, um, it's a, a microscopically guided form of surgery. And we only go back in areas where we see cancer and remove, um, remove cancer in those areas. So this is often, um, the benefit of this uh, procedure is that it often, uh, it does uh, often uh, gives, gives us a smaller scar. Um, you know, we still have to remove the cancer, so what, there, it will always be a scar, um, but it minimizes the scar. Um, it also gives us a very high cure rate. So when do you know, um, you know, when should you consider Mohs um, versus traditional surgery? Again, the vast majority of basal cells can be treated with um, traditional surgery. So you should consider most when um, there are skin cancers that are in high risk or cosmetically or functionally sensitive areas. So especially the head and neck on your hands because there's not a whole lot of tissue before you're on fascia um, uh, and then deeper structures. Um, feet over the bones, um, the genitalia, um, tumor size greater than two centimeters anywhere on the body, recurrent tumors, ill-defined margins, immunocompromised patients, and then again, those kind of histologic and um, clinical features that are associated with um, uh, aggressive behavior. Um, there is actually an app um, that can be used to um, kind of tell you whether something is appropriate or not appropriate uh, for most. So these are just some examples um, of uh, patients um, with uh, basal cell cancers. So this is a, you know, nodular and superficial basal cell cancer on the back of the ear. It looks very well demarcated, but this is uh, the same patient after five stages of Mohs and it's still positive. And this was the final defect. And so this is just to highlight that basal cells, you know, especially on the ears, they can look very well circumscribed, they can look small, but it's, they're deceptive. Um, there's really not a whole lot of skin before you're on cartilage. Um, and they, when they, especially the superficial component, as I mentioned before, um, can really have subclinical spread beyond what you can see with your naked eye. Um, this is a second case of a basal cell um, cancer. So this would obviously, um, you know, you probably wouldn't do traditional surgery in something like this, um, both because you can't take your four millimeter margins because this goes right up to the eyelid. And also because again, with your traditional surgery, the surgeon doesn't know how deep to take this. So, you know, should, should this go through and through and kind of remove the entire eyelid? Um, should we save anything? Um, so this would definitely not be your standard low risk basal cell cancer. So this is something that would qualify for most. So um, in this instance, we marked around it, again, two millimeter margins um, and try to save as much of the eyelid as possible. So I went right up to the gray line. Um, this did go through um, the skin, um, the muscle um, and, and the orbital septum. And so it's, what you're seeing here is kind of the deeper fat, um, but this patient cleared. And then um, with the help of my colleagues in um, um, plastics, uh, uh, they were able to repair this patient. Um, so, um, you know, nowadays with, um, with, you know, with Mohs and with plastic surgery, really we can have, give patients very, very good outcomes, um, even with large um, tumors that patients oftentimes think would otherwise be disfiguring. So this is just to highlight um, what basal cells can do. So I get this question a lot in my clinic um, where patients say, you know, that's just a basal cell. What's the worst that can happen? You know, I'm not going to die. Um, 
And I, I do remind them that, you know, basal cells are slow growing, but they will grow through everything. And if you see somebody with, um, with something like this, um, I would be very, very um, nervous about delaying surgery um, or treatment any further, because at this point, it's really eaten through the cartilage, which is why you're seeing the, the nostril um, become misshapen, okay? Um, so this was the um, partial defect. So we ended up actually removing the, all the cartilage, and this was still positive. Um, we are, I actually uh, uh, turned this over to my colleagues in uh, ENT to um, finish. Uh, uh, they had to remove some bone as well from, from the top um, in order to completely clear this patient. Um, so, um, recurrence rates for excision and Mohs. So, for primary basal cells, the recurrence rates are um, depending on which literature you read and also depending on how far out. Um, so, a lot of basal cells, when they recur, they're not going to recur in a year or two. You really have to look at literature that goes five years, ten years out. Um, so, for primary basal cells, the recurrence rates are as high as, you know, about 10 or 12 percent, um, about 10 years out. And then for most surgery, it can go up to about 4 percent, um, about 10 years out. Uh, but again, uh, most surgery does offer a uh, cure rate, uh, a benefit in terms of cure rate, especially for the right population. For recurrent basal cells, the recurrent rates goes up for both excision and most surgery. Um, so it can be as high as, you know, a quarter of patients um, with tradi traditional surgery and about 4%, um, even with most surgery. And then for basal squamous uh, carcinoma, as I mentioned before, as high as almost 50% for excisional surgery. And even with most, it's about 10%. So I get this question a lot about, you know, radiation therapy, you know, um, radiation uh, therapy is definitely an option, uh, but you do have to carefully select patients and counsel patients. Um, I tend to get very young patients and very elderly patients um, who are interested in radiation therapy. Very young patients because they're worried about surgery and, and scars, and so they think that it is a less invasive form of treatment. Um, and then elderly patients because, um, of course, they, uh, they want less invasive treatment options. Um, a couple of things I remind them, um, radiation therapy, you do need multiple treatments. Um, there can be higher recurrence rates, especially with more aggressive variants, um, especially on the nose, uh, because they don't want to um, irradiate uh, so much that, you know, again, we affect the cartilage. Um, and then again, if something's already been treated before, those are not really great candidates um, for radiation therapy. The thing I caution uh, younger patients about is that cosmesis tends to worsen over time. So even though there's no, you know, um, surgical scar, um, the skin changes. Um, and over time, uh, you do see radiation um, changes in the skin. And you also have to weigh the risk of developing future skin cancers because, of course, you, um, you're, you are irradiating the site. Um, many of you uh, may already know, um, but basal, we now have targeted therapies for basal cells. So for um, locally aggressive variants and for metastatic basal cells, which do occur even though they're rare, um, we do have targeted therapies um, if they are not surgical candidates or candidates for radiation. So what we know is that basal cell cancers um, have um, mutations in the um, patched smoothened pathway. Um, and so, you know, a normal skin um, smoothened is normally inhibited by patch one. And in basal cell cancers, um, you can either have a loss of mutation in patch one or an activating mutation in smoothened, which then um, becomes constitutively active and um, affects the downstream signaling pathways that then go on and cause your basal cells. So we know that they're um, this is the molecular basis for basal cell cancers. This Motigib, um, or um, Aravej, as it's called, is the first-in-class smoothen inhibitor. It was approved in 2012 um, for metastatic or um, recurrent or locally advanced basal cells um, who are not candidates for surgery or radiation. Um, it's a pill uh, that's taken 150 milligrams daily um, and uh, it's basically taken until um, toxicity, um, until uh, the toxicity profile becomes too disturbing for the patient to continue, or until um, disease recurrence. Uh, but it's a hedgehog, uh, so I'm sorry, it's a smoothen inhibitor um, that blocks the signaling pathway. Um, so these are just pub from the published literature. So these are examples of patients who um, have been put on vesmodigib, and um, you know, there have been some amazing um, responses um, to this medication. Um, and this is an example of, uh, you know, uh, lung metastasis. 
So you're uh, noticing the lung nodules that get smaller. The one of the downsides of mismotajib um, as a targeted therapy is that uh, they can still, patients can still develop resistance um, over time. And so that's what you're seeing over here. So even though they initially responded, um, they did um, ultimately uh, become resistant to the medication. So this is from uh, the New England Journal of Medicine um, study uh, that was published back in 2012 um, when it was FDA approved. Um, this basically shows that about a third of patients with metastatic basal cell cancers will um, respond. Um, and then almost half of patients with locally advanced basal cell cancers will um, respond, including about 20, 25% um, with complete response. So this has been um, very, very good um, for, for the right patients. The downside, though, for bismodigib is that it's very costly. Um, it's, um, it tends to be covered by insurance. However, um, it is something that patients need to take until, again, they can't tolerate the side effects or until disease progression. And the side effects can actually be, essentially every patient gets side effects. Um, so the most common ones being weight loss, uh, fatigue, dyskusia, so loss of taste or altered taste, um, um, alopecia, um, and muscle spasms. Um, so these are basically in all patients, we'll, we'll see these. Um, I would say the ones that really affect patient are the taste. Um, uh, the taste and the muscle spasms. So in terms of quality of life, um, the, the taste and muscle spasms are probably um, uh, the top reasons why patients end up stopping. Um, and then even though 50% do respond in terms of locally advanced basal cell cancers, um, remember that 50% don't respond. And then of the initial responders, about 20% will develop resistance um, and will uh, progress even after they initially respond. So that's kind of the downside of this bismodigib. So there's, this is still an area of really a lot of um, lit, um, study. Um, so a lot of people are trying to figure out, um, you know, are there other ways to dose this modigib so that it's more tolerable but still effective? Um, and so this is just one example um, where um, the authors uh, – tried this intermittent dosing regimen. So they kind of take them, you know, put them on for 12 weeks and then you know, take them off for eight weeks. And they try to do a couple of different um, intermittent dosing regimens. So what they showed is that clinical response was similar. Um, however, uh, patients still got uh, the side effects and 47% uh, discontinued treatment in, in both the um, intermittent dosing um, uh, uh, arms. Um, so the side effects are still unfortunately um, present. Um, Vismotigib as neoadjuvant therapy. So when Vismotigib first came on the market, um, there was a lot of interest in using Vismotigib to kind of shrink the tumors and then maybe do MOs around these, um, these um, shrunken tumors. Um, it really hasn't taken off, uh, especially in the uh, MO surgery community, because um, what we've seen is that um, well, so this is an example of an uh, um, investigator-initiated open-label trial of uh, Vismotigib as neoadjuvant therapy. What we notice is that patients need to be on it for at least three months before we see a response. Um, so I would say patients have to be on it for at least three months, and basically patients will get um, side effects by, um, by the time they're on it for at least three months. And the thing that really worried a lot of us is that, um, you know, these tumors can appear clinically cured, but when you cut into them or when you biopsy the areas that look cured, um, there can still be areas of histologic residual basal cell cancers. And so that was really concerning. Um, the, for the most surgery community, what we are really concerned with is our skip lesions. So when the reason most surgery is so effective is because you're able to assume that the tumor is one contiguous tumor. And so once you get that clear margin, you say, oh, this was, if this is one contiguous tumor, then once you're around it, you're around it and you know that it's gone. The concern with Vismotigib is, you know, now could we have areas where it looks clear, but then you move over an area and that's a skip legion that maybe didn't respond. So we don't know that it's all um, responding at the same rate or equally. Um, so that really concerns a lot of us. Um, the authors also found that um, the, the histology um, um, uh, histologic changes in the skin after um, initiation of this modigib also made interpretation um, with most very, very challenging um, and, and could be very misleading at times. Um, so I just mentioned that. Um, there's also um, case reports of, again, histologic changes after this modigib. So in this case, um, uh, 
what was initially, um, you know, just a regular um, basal cell cancer, um, a nodular basal cell cancer turned into a spindled or squamoid uh, tumor. And as I mentioned before, basal squamous carcinomas are considered more aggressive and then your basal cell, your traditional nodular basal cells. And so we don't know what the implications of the squamous differentiation is. Um, and so there's also some concern about that. Um, so just a quick recap, uh, we talked a little bit about risk factors for advanced basal cell cancers and also some treatment options, including um, mismodigib, which is a targeted therapy. All right, so the next um, section I want to talk about uh, are uh, for squamous cell carcinomas. So cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas, and um, there's been a lot of um, interest in squamous cells in the last five years, um, and uh, this is still an area of active research. So things can still change from what I'm telling you today. So um, second most common skin cancer, um, estimated you know, up to a million case, new cases a year. Again, not reported in any national registry, so it's very difficult to estimate. And unlike basal cell cancers, where I told you it was due to um, intermittent high dose radiation, this is really due to chronic cumulative UV exposure. So these are the farmers, um, contractors, people who work outdoors um, and just get year round um, sun. Um, we tend to see more squamous cell uh, cancers in, in this population compared to basal cells. So in addition to chronic sun exposure, immunosuppressed patients, especially there are certain uh, medications that are more um, higher risk uh, for developing, that are higher risk for developing squamous cell cancers and azathioprine is definitely one of them. Uh, my patients on azathioprine are, um, are unfortunately, I, I see them almost every month or two months and they can develop new ones every visit they come in. High risk HPV um, it, uh, is a, a risk factor. And then I wanna make sure I highlight chronic ulcers and inflammation. So, um, in the past, when I've given a similar talk, um, you know, I've been asked, you know, a lot, all your pictures or all your cases are of Caucasian patients. What about um, patients of color? And um, patients of color do develop squamous cell cancers. They, um, they're they often missed um, because we don't think of them as um, a lot of a lot of doctors don't think of them as, you know, being as high risk because they have a little bit more pigment in their skin, um, which is a little bit more protective. However, I think the reason it gets um, missed in this, this population is even if it's not due to UV exposure, um, they, patients can often have, uh, you know, diabetic ulcers or, or just ulcers in general. And sites um, of chronic inflammation are at higher risk of developing squamous cell cancers that are often not diagnosed um, uh, early enough and often um, are more aggressive at the time of diagnosis. So I want to um, remind you all that um, it can affect um, patients of all colors. So um, these are kind of your prototypical squamous cell carcinomas, these kind of um, erythematous uh, plaque or pink plaques, nodules, that type of thing. Um, I just want to remind you all that it, they can develop on the ears um, and they can develop on the lips, um, especially on the lower lips that gets more sun. So I see uh, a lot of squames on the lower lips of uh, both women and men. Um, and again, this is just highlighting how subtle that squamous cell can be on the lower lips. So a lot of times, you know, if a patient comes in and says, hey, this is, there's a chap, an area of chapped lips, um, but it's the same area, I will oftentimes biopsy it, especially if they look like um, they have other um, areas of UV damage or they have a history of um, uh, skin cancers. So I'll biopsy and it will come back a squame. So... Um, the mortality for squamous cell cancers is a little bit higher um, than basal cell cancers. It's around 5%, um, and it can be higher in immunosuppressed patients. Um, so just remember that um, even though we don't think of squamous cell cancers as um, in the same category that we put a lot of patients with melanoma, um, remember that 5% you know, of a lot is actually more than, um, you know, um, well, depending on which stage of melanoma, uh, but there's actually far fewer patients with melanoma um, annually diagnosed in the U.S. than there are squamous cell cancer. So actually in terms of um, absolute numbers, um, there's more metastatic squamous cell cancers than there are of metastatic melanoma. Um, and so I put this um, case in here. This is a very straightforward squamous cell cancer, but I want to highlight the difference between this case and the next case that I'm going to show you. So on the pathology report, this was read as an invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Um, this patient ended up having MOS because it was a cosmetically sensitive area. And so um, cleared after one stage, you know, into the superficial fat, um, you know, not a big deal, not a large cancer, um, you know, not 
too disfiguring and she healed very well. She was very happy, but this was an invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Oh, this is just to highlight um, that it was tissue sparing. This, uh, on the other patient, on the other hand, uh, is also an invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So if you just look at a pathology report, you wouldn't know, um, well, when you look at the patient, you would know that this is definitely a different beast than the prior case. But if you just look at the histology report, you may not know that. Um, so you really have to look at um, the patient and correlate it with the pathology report to figure out which are the patients with the more aggressive variants of squamous cell carcinomas that are a higher risk of developing uh, recurrence, nodal metastasis, distant metastasis. Um, so this was an immunocompetent patient, um, I think had let this go for a little while. Um, and this I treated with Mohs, uh, but what you're seeing here is that it's actually down on bone. Um, and at, uh, so this is bone, um, infiltrated the muscle, infiltrated the periosteum, um, and this is on bone. This is a very different beast than the prior invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So what are some, some of the characteristics of aggressive disease? Um, number one, poor differentiation. So um, the way I explain to patients um, is, you know, the, you know, if you have a well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, it's, it's a skin cancer of squamous cell cancers, but you can still recognize it, right? Um, it's like a tumor of, tumor of apples. You know, it's, it's, it's a bad apple, but you can still tell that it was an apple to begin with. The more poorly differentiated um, squamous cell carcinomas, you can no longer even tell what they were originally. You really have to rely on stains to identify the cell lineage. And those are like you know, um, apples that are so rotten that you couldn't tell they were apples to begin with. So a lot of patients understand that um, analogy. These are at higher risk of recurrence and metastasis. There's also a variant called the dysmoplastic squamous cell, just like there was of um, the morpheiform or dysmoplastic um, basal cell. So these are more scar-like. Um, these are also very challenging. So these are just examples on histology of um, some of the more aggressive uh, subtypes of squamous cell cancers. In this case, this is actually called a single cell squamous cell carcinoma. So what you're noticing here is that it's not just one big ball of tumor cells. Um, it's actually kind of broken up and these are gonna be very challenging. They're gonna have a very high recurrence rate because it's not all one contiguous tumor. And this is an example of the desmoplastic squamous cell carcinoma. The stroma is actually more uh, scar-like um, and can be, make it very challenging to kind of see or find these little tumor islands. And these are, again, going to have more uh, higher risk for recurrence because you're going to more you're going to be more likely to miss uh, tumor, especially if you treat them with traditional surgery with bread loafing. So. If there's nothing else that um, you remember from this talk, the one thing I would like to, you to remember is two centimeter is kind of our cutoff. So if you read any literature on squamous, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, um, all the studies have shown us that tumors with diameters greater than two centimeters are at higher risk of developing a recurrence, nodal metastasis, and are associated with disease specific death. Um, so, you know, even if you don't remember poor differentiation, you know, all the things that you don't know until you biopsy them. Just by looking at a tumor, if you can see that the squamous cell carcinoma is greater than two centimeters in diameter, that should immediately, um, you know, kind of um, uh, perk your ears and let you know that that's going to be a more aggressive tumor. So that's a very easy, um, you know, from the corner of the room, you can diagnose those. Tumor depth, so the uh, more um, deeply invasive, obviously, the more um, aggressive these can be. Perineural involvement, uh, recurrence, um, location on the lip or ear, again, uh, associated with higher uh, metastasis rate, um, as high as 14% on the lips um, and 9% on the ears. Uh, again, SECs arising from chronic scars, okay, 26% metastasis. Um, I really think that this, I mean, there's no way to prove it, but we think that this is really because they're just not diagnosed um, early enough. You know, somebody has a chronic ulcer, we just assume it's an ulcer that's not healing, but you know, if you have a chronic ulcer that's just not responding to treatment or um, an ulcer that initially responded and then starts to ulcerate again, I would biopsy those because they can turn into squamous cell carcinomas. Um, and then immunosuppression. Um, so when I talk about, so this is an area of really active research. Um, so I, I put this slide in here just to kind of remind us of what the goals of cancer staging are. I'm going to watch my time and make sure we have Enough time, okay. Um, so the goals of cancer staging are um, to separate patients into groups that are distinct, meaning that um, the outcomes are gonna differ between the stages, right? So stage one, two, three, four. Um, um, also separate patients into groups that are homogenous. So the patients within the same stage are um, going to have similar outcomes. And then um, 
and then separate them into groups that are monotonous. So meaning that um, as you go from one stage to the next, there's a difference in outcome that's, that's you know, it tends to worsen. So um, this is an old HACC staging uh, system. Um, we have now moved away from it. We're now in HACC 8, which uh, went into effect in 2018. So it's only about two years old or so. Um, but this is just to highlight that it wasn't, it was not that long ago that we were using this staging system, the AJCC 7 staging system. And basically, you don't have to remember any of this because it's already out of date. Uh, but basically, the, the, the thing that a lot of people didn't realize about AJCC 7 is that there was, it was never validated in any prospective or retrospective patient populations. Um, the AJCC7 staging system for squamous cell carcinomas was um, based off of literature review and expert consensus um, and never validated. And so again, this is out of date, so I'm, I'm just trying to make a point here. Um, so with the prior AJCC7 staging system, you know, you went from T1 where tumors are less, um, two centimeters or less in diameter, to T2, tumors are greater than two centimeters diameter with, with some high risk features, to T3, tumor invasion of maxilla, mandible, orbit, or temporal bone. So there was a big jump from T2 to T3, and then T4 was invasion of skeletal axial um, uh, uh, skeleton or the skull base. So there was a big jump. Um, in 2013, this is a paper that's really made an impact in the dermatology field. Um, it's been uh, widely cited. Um, the um, Dr. Uh, Chrysalyn Schmoltz at BWH um, evaluated the AJCC tumor staging system. And um, what she did is she looked at um, her population of high-risk squamous, cutaneous squamous cell cancers at BWH. And she looked at, you know, the outcomes that we would be interested in, you know, local recurrence, nodal metastasis, disease-specific death, all-cause death. And she looked at uh, almost, uh, you know, over 250 tumors. And she looked at, you know, how good is AJCC7 at prognosticating which patients were going to end up with these bad outcomes, which is what we're really interested in. And in her patient population, 54% um, of her patients fell into the T1 category and 44%. So almost half were T1, half were T2. There were only four cases of T3 and T4. And this is at, you know, a large um, tertiary referral center. Um, majority of poor outcomes were in T2, but it was sort of meaningless because half of your patients are in the T2 category. So you're not really able to tell who's really going to um, go on and have poor outcomes when half your patients are in that, in that grouping. So she um, performed, a, uh, or her team performed a multivariate um, analysis, looking at several different characteristics that are associated with poor outcome. And they identified four um, high risk features that are independently associated with um, uh, uh, poor outcomes. Poor differentiation, which I've already mentioned, tumor diameter, again, clinical tumor diameter, um, two centimeters or greater, pure neural invasion and depth beyond the subcutaneous fat. And so she used this and actually um, modified the AJCC um, staging system so, so that uh, she uh, broke the T2 stage down into T2A versus T2B. So these are the four high risk features. And so if you're T1, you have none of these features. So these are just your normal squames without any high risk features. T2, you have one high risk feature uh, sorry, T2A, you have one high-risk feature, and T2B, you have two to three high-risk features, and the T3, you have all of them, or there's bony invasion. So she kind of expanded the T2 um, category. And so this was a retrospective study, you know, looking at her, uh, she applied this to her patient population, um, but she was able to show um, better distinction between the T2A and T2B in terms of local recurrence, nodal metastasis, disease-specific death. So again, this is T2A, this is T2B, this is T3. Um, you, we didn't, there was no deaths with T1. And then all-cause death. Um, so this um, appeared to be better than AJCC7. And then um, subsequently, she published um, you know, a larger um, study validating that initial um, tumor uh, staging, her new kind of alternate, alternate tumor staging. Um, so here she looked at almost 2,000 invasive squames with a median follow-up of 4.2 years. She validated that same um, T staging system, um, again, tumor diameter greater than two centimeters. The only difference in this new um, study is that they um, saw only difference if the perineural invasion affected large caliber nerves as opposed to, you know, wispy nerves. Um, so uh, perineural invasion of 
larger nerves, poor differentiation, and invasion uh, beyond the fat. And um, these were her uh, results. So again, T2A versus T2B um, in terms of uh, local recurrence. This is nodal metastasis, T2A, T2B. Um, uh, this was disease-specific death. Again, there's no T1 really, but T2A versus T2B. And then um, uh, overall survival, uh, T2A um, versus T2B. So it does seem like her um, alternate um, staging um, was an improvement upon AJCC7. Um, so this was um, another study to kind of look at, um, you know, what about certain lymph node biopsy results? And again, comparing the HACC7 versus Brigham Women's, um, the BWH alternate staging um, criteria. And so they said, you know, which one is more better able to prognosticate who's going to have a positive central lymph node? Um, because a big area of controversy within our field is, you know, um, do we do central lymph nodes and when do we do them? And there's no great um, uh, guidelines because, um, because it just hasn't been well studied prior to this. And so um, when she looked at her, uh, sorry, this was not Crystalline Schmalz, this was actually a different group, um, Dr. Christian Baum. Um, so when this group looked at, um, they went through the literature and they also went through their own patient databases. This was a multi-center study. Um, and they looked at patients with adva uh, advanced uh, cutaneous squamous cell cancers who had undergone cell lymph node biopsies. And then they looked at uh, clinical features um, and stratified them based on AJCC7 versus BWH. They found that there were no cell lymph node positive tumor uh, cases in tumors less than two centimeters in diameter. In AJCC7, the majority of their cell lymph node positive tumors were in the T2 category, but then 92% of all the cases were T2 anyways. So again, AJCC7 was not able to tell them who should go on and have a cell lymph node because all the bad cases were in the T2 to begin with. Um, the BWH staging, um, only 20% of the cases belong to the T2B or T3, kind of your high risk category, but these represented um, over half of the cell lymph node positive cases. So based on this study, the BWH system does seem to be better um, prognosticator um, uh, uh, compared to the AJCC7. So a couple of things to consider. Um, number one, um, BWH has not been um, uh, applied in any prospective studies. These have all been retrospective studies. Um, when we look at some lymph node, which is again, a very, um, an area of a lot of interest and a lot of controversy, we still don't know whether some lymph node biopsies will improve prognostication or survival. Um, there is a false negative rate with some lymph node biopsies and, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in doing cell lymph node biopsies, but um, given the number of squames um, in the country, there's um, implications for cost um, down the road if we decide to uh, perform cell lymph node biopsies um, for these patients. So we really want to know, you know, the high risk population that really needs this. So um, I just told you there's a lot of controversy. So what do I do? Um, so what I will typically do when I first approach patients is palpate draining lymph nodes. Um, and if they do meet, um, you know, two, three, or definitely four um, high-risk uh, features, according to the BWH staging criteria, I will get a pre-op CT of the draining lymph nodes. And then I do recommend, even after surgery or definitive treatment, that we continue to monitor the lymph node uh, basin. Um, I will typically get a, a, a CT scan um, in about three to six months post-op, and then get it one year. Um, one thing I keep in mind is that um, over 75% of recurrences occur within the first two years for squamous cell carcinomas. Um, so usually I will monitor them for the first two years and then, um, and then if they're disease-free at that point, um, I no longer image them and I only do it if clinically uh, needed. So I spent a lot of time talking about AJCC7 and how it's out of date. Um, this is just to say that in 2018, we moved to AJCC8. Um, so AJCC8 um, is a little bit better. Um, so T1 is, again, tumor diameter less than 2 centimeters. T2 is 2 to 4 centimeters. Um, T3 is greater than 4 centimeters or bony er erosion, perineural invasion, etc. cetera. Um, so, um, again, you can kind of stage these just by looking at them, you know, even before um, any pathology comes back. Um, Dr. Schmaltz's group did apply the AJCC8 um, criteria to their patient population of the, the, the 2,000 um, patients that they um, looked at. And um, they, you know, there is better distinction between T2 versus T3 um, for local recurrence, nodal metastasis, um, uh, disease-specific death and all-cause death, but it's still not great. Um, so this is just to keep in mind that AJCC8 is still not um, 
probably could be approved upon. So it is better than HACC 7. Um, one thing to consider is that um, if you read the manual, it actually says it's only applicable to head and neck cutaneous squames. So it is not meant to be applied to um, squames off the head and neck. Um, there are still no prospective validating studies and we're still um, comparing this to the BWHT staging system. Um, but based on at least that one study from Dr. Schmoltz's group, it, um, I would argue that BWH is still better than HACC8. So um, I wanna make sure, I'm probably gonna skip the last part um, because we're out of time, but I do want to mention management of squames. So the majority of your kind of low risk squames on low risk areas, you can take um, wide local excision with half a centimeter margin, you can get 95% cure rate, but you really do want to consider things like margin control with most surgery for uh, sensitive body sites and high risk squames. Um, you can consider radiation, uh, it has the same caveats as um, what I've mentioned already for basal cell cancers. And then I do want to just mention very briefly that there is now an FDA approved PD-1 inhibitor, uh, semiplumab or liptio uh, for advanced, locally advanced uh, or metastatic cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas um, that are not uh, surgically uh, operable. Um, there is uh, data out now that about half of those patients will respond to this PD-1 inhibitor. So we do also have more targeted therapies for um, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma as well. This is an area of um, really active research. I think they're gonna have more uh, newer data that's gonna be published in the fall. So I didn't wanna go too far into it, but um, the initial studies um, are showing about 50% uh, response rates. So uh, it's another good option. So just as a recap, we talked about some of the aggressive features of cutaneous squames. And again, if you remember nothing else, just remember two centimeters in diameter is your cutoff. So once you go above two centimeters in diameter, I would consider that a high risk tumor. Um, uh, we talked about AJCC uh, staging criteria, which I know is very commonly used for most tumors, but in the instance of cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas, um, I'm actually not sure that it is the best um, staging criteria to use. And then I talked about BWH um, alternate staging criteria. Um, I was going to talk about prevention of skin cancers and just kind of tell, give you some um, tips for counseling patients. I think I'm going to skip through most of this because we, uh, we're out of time and just talk about sunscreen because that's been in the news a lot. So you all probably know the difference between sunscreen versus sunblock. Um, sunscreens are... Um, chemicals um, that absorb the sun's rays um, and... Um, Oh, sorry. Okay. If there are any questions, I can stop early, but I will um, hopefully finish in the next five minutes. Um, so sunscreens are chemicals that absorb the sun rays as opposed to physical sun blocks um, that sit on the skin and block the sun rays from reaching your skin. Um, you really wanna look for broad spectrum sunscreens. And so among the chemical ones, really there, um, there are really only a few um, ingredients that really give you broad spectrum, and that's avobenzone and mexoril. Um, it's been in the news a lot because um, a lot of the chemical sunscreens affect coral reefs, and um, they're also um, more readily absorbed than previously believed. So the FDA, um, I know last year, there was a, a lot of publication about um, how chemical sunscreens are actually absorbed in the body and can be found in concentrations much higher than um, previously believed, and now the FDA is um, requesting that we do um, safety studies to make sure that these chemicals are actually safe um, to be applied. Um, I guess this is the one thing I wanna highlight. So avobenzone um, and oxybenzone are probably the two most common ingredients in chemical sunscreens. And what you see is that oxybenzone includes, uh, absorbs up to UV, um, UV2, but not UVA. Avobenzone absorbs um, across the UVA spectrum. But compare that to our mineral sun blocks, which are zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Out of all the ingredients out there, zinc oxide is the best blocker. So it blocks across UVA and UVB. Um, so whenever I have a high risk patient and they ask me um, to counsel them about um, what sun screens or sun blocks to buy, I usually ask them to look for something with zinc oxide. Um, the other thing I wanna point to your attention is SPF refers to UVB protection only and it's tested in quantities of two milligrams per centimeter squared. So that, 
every study that's been done has shown that people do not put on sunscreen in the amounts that they need to to get the true SPF. And so even though the American Academy of Dermatology says that SPF of 30 is as high as you need to go, I counsel my patients to go up to 50 because I know that they're only putting on a quarter of what they're supposed to put on. So they're not truly getting the SPF of 30 that's advertised. And then one last plug um, that you may not know is um, UV. So SPF refers to UVB. There is a grading system for UVA, which we now know does contribute to skin cancers. And that is the PA system. It's more, it's starting to become adopted in the US, but this re really originated in Asia, especially in Japan and Korea. Um, but uh, what you wanna look for is a PA and the more um, plus signs after the PA, the better protection against UVA. Um, so I think I'll just end it right there and um, take any questions. Well, thank you for a very informative Grand Rounds. Um, we have one forwarded from Dr. Fisher, who said, uh, in regards to BCC, is there any utility of prevention with niacin? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, <laughs> I get that a lot. Um, so I know that there, um, there were several, there have been several published uh, papers about this now. Um, you know, <sighs> I, I know that statistically uh, there's been shown to be, um, you know, a difference, but I've used it in my patients and um, clinically, I don't see much of a difference. I don't know if I'm just using it in kind of my higher risk patients who are kind of looking for anything and everything they can to kind of decrease the tumor burden because they just have so many, um, but they, they continue to develop these, these um, cancers. And so uh, most of them have just fall, you know, um, stopped taking it, even though they, they've tried it. I, I guess, you know, I, I tell my patients, it's not going to hurt you. It's a vitamin, you know, it's a vitamin B. Um, it's not really going to hurt you. Um, but I, I'm not convinced that cl it makes a difference clinically, um, even though statistically it might. Thank you. And I think Dr. Sandberg speaks for everybody when she says great grand rounds. And thank you. Dr. Welton, says, how do you counsel people on the need to get vitamin D and to protect the skin against solar injury? That's yeah, that, really yeah, that's, um, that's, uh, uh, that's actually a really good question. Usually I say, you know, you're allowed to go out in the sun, um, just don't go in the, you know, noon hours. Um, and, uh, you know, you can definitely get your vitamin D check. There are other forms of um, vitamin D. You really don't need to be out in the sun that long to get vitamin D, um, to be honest with you. Um, but then there's also a lot of question about, you know, um, this is a total another talk, but um, are higher vitamin D levels protective against um, things like skin cancer? And that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have one question on the vismotative. Uh, you yeah. said that 50% do not respond. Are there any markers for this or the other treatment with regard to SEC to predict who's going to respond? No, unfortunately, um, there isn't. Um, so I, you know, um, I would, I definitely work with my medical oncology colleagues. I think they'll basically put them on for at least six months. Um, and then, um, you know, if they're still not responding after six months, then they will, um, they will, you know, a lot of times by then the toxicity is just not worth it if they're still not responding. Um, but I'll leave that to my medical oncology colleagues. Um, you know, PD-1 inhibitors are notorious. You cannot rely on PD-1 levels of tumors to predict whether somebody will or will not respond to PD-1 inhibitors. Um, so that's not a great marker. Okay, thank you. And from Dr. O'Brien, any role for topical therapy for small SCC? Yeah, um, yeah, I do do some field therapy. Um, it's off label, um, and I would only do it for SCCIS. So you know your superficial squames and and in low risk areas. So probably not like near the eye or uh, on the lips or something. So you have to be very selective with how you do it. You know, I have in my high risk skin cancer clinic, I have patients who are unfortunately one large walking squame. Um, you know, these are patients on immunosuppressives and you know, I could biopsy anywhere on their body and it'll be squame. And so especially in those patients, I'm not gonna do surgery. You know, I'm not gonna do surgery everywhere. Um, so I will rely a lot on field therapy, but I will, warn them that it's not, you know, not FDA approved. I see them back very frequently. Um, if something grows, doesn't respond, um, or if it hurts, um, that's a key. If something hurts, um, that needs a biopsy, and that's not something that I should be treating topically. 